Hey everyone, my name is Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. I'm back with another true crime story to lull you to sleep or perhaps to give you nightmares. Tonight's true crime case is a unique one. It's not like any other true crime story that I've told before. Most of us have been bullied at one point or another in our life, whether it be during childhood, high school, or even as an adult. But what happens when the person being bullied finally snaps and retaliates? Is it justified? What if they go so far in their retaliation that they come up with a plan to violently murder their bully? Tonight, we're talking about the murder of Bobby Kent, a 20-year-old alleged bully. He was violently murdered by a group of young adults who said that they had finally had enough of the terrible treatment that they received by Bobby. But were they telling the truth? Were they tormented by Bobby relentlessly until the point that they snapped? Or was it all just an excuse for them to lash out and to kill someone? Maybe it's something in between. I'll let you decide. So let's jump right in. This story may sound familiar to you because there's actually a movie about this case called Bully from 2001 starring Brad Renfro. I haven't watched the movie yet because I don't want to get caught up in all of the Hollywood story, which can oftentimes be embellished, but I can definitely understand why there would be a film about it because it almost sounds too outlandish to be true, but unfortunately it is. Bobby Kent was a 20-year-old young man living in Hollywood, Florida, which is a popular vacation destination situated between Fort Lauderdale and Miami. His parents, Fred and Farah, had immigrated to the United States from Iran before he was born, so he didn't grow up having the same struggles as they did back in their homeland. It's said that Bobby grew up to be very privileged. His family did well financially, and his parents spared no expense when it came to whatever Bobby wanted. While he wasn't exactly an overachiever by any means, Bobby did all right in school. He was active, motivated, and he had goals that he wanted to reach. He was also said to be very popular. He was fit, attractive, and really cared about his looks because he spent the majority of his time at the gym lifting weights with his 21-year-old best friend, Marty Puccio. Marty had been Bobby's best friend for the last 14 years, and they did absolutely everything together. It was the type of friendship where if you saw one of them, you knew the other one had to be just around the corner, but it definitely wasn't a healthy or a happy friendship. The two were more like a toxic couple who couldn't seem to stay away from each other no matter how dangerous things became. There were allegations that Bobby was a bully, so much so that he even bullied his best friend, Marty. He would physically assault Marty pretty regularly. The two would get into violent fights with Marty begging Bobby to stop. But Bobby was practically a machine. This is a very strong, physically fit, large 20-year-old male that we're talking about. Still, even in their younger days, Marty would come home after hanging out with Bobby and he'd have bruises and cuts all over his body. Bobby owned a Doberman that for whatever reason was known to be aggressive with Marty. The dog would literally attack him. So of course, Marty wanted to keep away from him, but Bobby would force him to engage with the dog. The dog would bite him on the arms, legs, and abdomen, and Bobby would just sort of stand there laughing while Marty was bleeding. It's unclear to me why Marty would ever hang around with a guy like that, but apparently he did try to get away at one point. In fact, Marty had asked his parents if they could move to another town just so that he could get away from Bobby. His parents refused, so instead he moved in with relatives in New York. He stayed there for a while, but eventually he would move back into town and immediately Bobby would start abusing him again. It was very much a love-hate relationship and it reminds me very much of an abusive romantic relationship where there is this toxic bond that is formed that makes it difficult for the victim to get away from their abuser. It may be one reason why Marty dropped out of high school in grade 11. He struggled the entire time with what many people didn't know, he was being bullied by Bobby. Bobby and Marty would also go to a popular local bar that had male dancers who would dance and strip for money. 
Bobby pressured Marty into dancing at the club to earn tips, and then they would split the money. Bobby refused to let Marty quit when he tried to back out of it all, and he even blackmailed him by threatening to tell all of their friends that Marty was gay, which wasn't even true. Marty even had a girlfriend at the time named Lisa. Still, he wasn't going to take a chance, so he continued to strip in front of men for money and give Bobby half his earnings. Not everyone saw Bobby in the same light that Marty did. Like I said, Bobby was popular. There were many people who perceived Bobby to be an attractive, bright, charismatic go-getter. After graduating from high school, Bobby enrolled in community college. He had a vision for his future and he wasn't going to waste any time. He had an entrepreneurial spirit and he wanted to start a car stereo business with his dad. He had other ideas for ways that he could start his own side hustle, but they weren't always moral or legitimate. And when he wasn't in school, he spent all the rest of his time at the gym, usually with Marty. Now, I mentioned that Bobby was this massive beast with huge muscles. Well, it's believed that he didn't get that way just by working out and that he was actually using steroids. One common side effect of using steroids is being very temperamental, hostile, and aggressive. According to people who attended the same gym as Bobby, this would often manifest into angry outbursts, especially targeted towards random strangers who were also working out at the gym. It was kind of just an unspoken known fact that Bobby was this aggressive steroid user who targeted just about anyone who got in his way. It was almost like Bobby had two split personalities, the charming, charismatic side, and then the angry, violent, aggressive side of him. There was one man who was also a patron of the gym who happened to be gay, and it's alleged at one point that he tried flirting with Bobby, who rejected his advances. Still, Bobby saw this man's romantic interest as an opportunity. He convinced this man to produce a porno using his father's video recording equipment, and he had Marty help him with the production. Now in this video, this man is seen standing in front of the camera naked while performing sex acts on himself. Bobby had zero experience actually producing a video, let alone a porno, but he thought that he could make a ton of money by producing and selling these low-budget amateur porn videos. Of course, I've never seen the video myself, but those who have say that it was very poorly made and practically no one was interested in watching it. Brutal. Nonetheless, Bobby and Marty showed the video to just about anyone who would watch it. According to friends, the two young men seemed really proud of the video that they created and they had plans to make many more. Unfortunately, the man who starred in their first video saw through the bullshit and didn't want to star in any more homemade videos, which Bobby didn't like. So Bobby and Marty, well, they beat him up. It's safe to say that while Marty is a victim of Bobby's abuse, I mean, many people have seen it, he's also far from innocent. He participated in a lot of terrible behavior alongside Bobby. The two young men seemed to bring out the absolute worst in each other, but they were inseparable. It may have been a case where Marty was tired of feeling like a victim, so he was happy to have someone else to target for a change. Another one of these targets was a mentally challenged man who worked at a local grocery store as a beggar, someone who puts the groceries in the grocery bag. This man was known to pick up groceries after his shift was over and then carry them home. Bobby and Marty would wait until he would finish working and follow him as he carried his groceries home. Then they would throw a football at the man's head, attempting to make him fall down with all of his bags, and they thought the whole thing was just hilarious. Now, it's hard to believe that Marty had any spare time at all since he was always with Bobby, but when he wasn't with Bobby, he was with his girlfriend, 20-year-old Lisa Connolly. As you can imagine, she absolutely hated Bobby and felt like he was a terrible influence on Marty. She knew how Bobby was physically violent towards Marty and told him constantly that he needed to get away from him. She also hated how much time the two men spent together because, of course, it was taking away from her time with her boyfriend. Lisa was said to be a very self-conscious young woman who was kind of obsessed with Marty. It's one of the reasons she took a backseat to Bobby for so long. 
Still, she decided to try to set Bobby up with her 18-year-old friend, Alice Willis, who went by Allie. Then the four of them could hang out together. She would get to see her boyfriend and there would be someone for Bobby. In my opinion, you're not that great of a friend if you think this guy is so terrible, but you'll hook him up with your girlfriend. Even though Allie was still kind of a baby herself, she had been married previously and also had a child from that marriage. Her parents mostly took care of the child. The relationship between Bobby and Allie was short-lived, and Allie alleged that he was physically violent towards her. She also alleged that he sexually assaulted her, threatened her life, and the life of her child, so the two went their separate ways. This is when there began whispers about how they could finally put an end to Bobby's tyranny. Lisa was said to be the organizer of this plan. She was now pregnant with Marty's baby, and she wanted Marty to cut ties with Bobby permanently. She had this deep hatred for him that she just couldn't explain, and she was in good company. Bobby had angered many people in his short life, including her friend Allie. According to Allie, Bobby threatened to murder her and smother her child unless she started dating him again. Allie would say that she was convinced he would really do it if he was ever given the opportunity. So Lisa and Allie, they came up with a plan to ensure that it would never happen. They were going to kill Bobby. Allie was going to lure him out to a rock pit, and Lisa was going to be hiding in the area with a gun. Allie was going to move out of the way, and then Lisa was going to shoot him dead. However, at the last minute, Lisa backed out of the plan and just couldn't go through with it. The following day, the two women decided that they would need more people to actually help carry out this plan. Bobby's ex-girlfriend, Allie, was now dating another man, 21-year-old Donald Semenek. He didn't personally know Bobby, but he had heard the stories from his now-girlfriend, Allie. She told Donald all about the physical and mental abuse that she had suffered at the hands of Bobby, and how he had even gone as far as to sexually assault her. Donald cared for Allie, so he was more than willing to help take Bobby down. Somehow, Lisa was also able to convince her cousin, 20-year-old Derek Duverco and 19-year-old Heather Swallows to join in on their plan as well. Again, Derek and Heather didn't have a whole lot of experience in actually dealing with Bobby. In fact, they had never even met him, but they were young and impressionable and apparently easily convinced. The final person to join in on this plan was 22-year-old Derek Kaufman, who was going to help with the muscle. Derek Kaufman had told just about anyone who would listen that he was a mafia hitman, although these claims have never been proven to be true. It's pretty interesting what you can convince people to do or what people will agree to do when in a group setting and when the peer pressure is laid on. This was a group of seven people, several of which did not even know the intended victim, who all agreed to go through with a murder. It's a pretty unusual thing to happen. Now the day was July 14th, 1993, and it was time to actually go through with the plot for murder. Derek Kaufman had recommended that they kill Bobby in a remote area that he had claimed to have killed people at before. Again, there's no actual evidence to suggest that he had ever really killed anyone previously. Allie was going to once again lure Bobby to the location with the promise of getting back together. She had also purchased a new car, and she told Bobby that they could go out to the spot and he could test it out, and then they could race the cars. They were going to pick Bobby up from his home in two cars and drive him to a remote rock pit area in western Broward County. Marty wore a trench coat and had a diver's knife strapped to his leg. He also decided to bring a metal pipe, just in case. Allie's boyfriend, Donald, also decided to bring a knife. And the group's muscle man, Derek Kaufman, he brought a blue and silver baseball bat. He hid in the trunk of the vehicle so that Bobby didn't have any clue that he was along for the ride. They picked Bobby up around 7 p.m. that evening. Bobby was really excited at the prospect of possibly hooking up with Allie that night and getting to drive her new car. He had no idea about the sinister plan that the group had agreed on. Now this needs to be said. The amount of physical violence they would inflict upon Bobby was outrageous. 
When the police would later find his body, they actually believed that an animal had torn him apart. So here's your warning that things are going to maybe get a little bit graphic here. When they arrived at the rock pit, Allie took Bobby by the hand down towards the water where she was going to distract him. The pair were flirting and Bobby likely thought that they were going to get intimate, but Allie's boyfriend was sneaking up behind them with his knife. Donald stabbed Bobby in the back of the neck and the rest of the group joined in on the attack. Bobby turned to see his longtime best friend, Marty, and he tried to beg for his life, but Marty also had a knife and began stabbing him in the stomach. Bobby Kent would ultimately die from multiple stab wounds that he received at the hands of the group. He would be stabbed twice in the back of the neck, penetrating Bobby's scalp as well. He was stabbed three times in the right shoulder. His abdomen was completely slashed open, with his injuries so deep that his intestines protruded from his body. As he tried to fight back, he received two more defensive wounds, one on his right arm and one on his left hand. His neck was sliced twice, so badly that his voice box was completely severed, preventing him from being able to speak or to breathe as blood filled his airways. He was stabbed in the heart, the lungs, between the ribs and the back of the chest. At one point, Bobby tried to get up and flee, but he was immediately stopped by his attackers. To end it all, Derek Kaufman took the baseball bat that he had brought with him and swung it at Bobby's head as he lied on the ground. Then Marty and Derek picked up Bobby's nearly lifeless body and threw it in the canal, hoping that the alligators would take care of the rest. They didn't, but Bobby would die alone in that canal. The group tossed all of their weapons into the canal, the two knives, the pipe, and the baseball bat, and then they headed to Hollywood Beach, where they would all agree to say that they had all been hanging out together that night. Of course, that evening, Bobby would never return home, and his parents would worry about his whereabouts. The first person they would ask, of course, was his best friend, Marty, who claimed that he had no idea where Bobby was. According to Marty, Bobby had gone on a date with a girl that he didn't know, and that was the last that he knew of his whereabouts. Of course, this was far from the truth, and Bobby was right where the group had left him, to die in that canal. But it's like that line out of the theme song for Pretty Little Liars. Got a secret. Can you keep it? Swear this one you'll save. Better lock it in your pocket, taking this one to the grave. If I show you, then I know you won't tell what I said, because two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. And it wasn't long before the teens began to talk. A secret like a murder is difficult to keep with more than one killer, but pretty much impossible to keep when we're talking about seven people involved. Bobby's parents had reported him missing when he didn't come home that night, and now the police were asking questions. The pressure was really heating up. Before we continue with tonight's case, I want to talk about a product that I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because I want more energy. I mean, who doesn't? So what is this stuff? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all the things. Tons of people take a multivitamin, and it's important that you choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. Athletic Greens has over 7,000 five-star reviews and is recommended by professional athletes. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com emerging. Again, that's athleticgreens.com emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our story. 
Marty's girlfriend, Lisa, who was quite pregnant, was the first one to talk. She confided in her mother about the murder, and it's alleged at that time that she claimed Bobby had raped her. She likely did this so that her mother would have sympathy for her and not just believe that she was a complete psychopath. Her mother called her sister, who was Derek DeVirco's mother, remember Lisa convinced her cousin Derek to participate, and he also confessed to what they had done together. Derek claimed that he had no part in the actual murder of Bobby, but he admitted to helping Marty carry Bobby's body to the canal and throw him in. Lisa told the police about the plan, but she still didn't show any remorse. She claimed that she was being terrorized by Bobby, and it was the only way to get him to stop. Derek would go as far as to show the police exactly where they had left the body. As I mentioned, because of the brutality of the murder, when police went to recover the body, they commented about how it looked like he had been ripped apart by animals, though nothing was eaten. Bobby was found in a white t-shirt and jeans, and it was clear that he had suffered a massive loss of blood. The crime scene itself was an area of around 30 feet, with blood spread throughout. Bobby had been left there for four days, decomposing, so his body was in terrible shape. They were able to use his wallet, which was found in his pants pocket, to confirm his identity as Bobby Kent. This once strong and healthy man was now reduced to nothing, just discarded in the canal. His cause of death was the stab wound to the heart, neck, and abdomen. He also had a head injury from blunt force trauma. Investigators confirmed at least two murder weapons were used, so the police noted that it was likely there were more than one attacker. Still, Bobby was a huge guy, so to think that Lisa and Derek could have done this alone, well, it wasn't likely. Investigators pushed for the names of other people they believed to be involved, and Lisa and Derek spilled the beans on Bobby's best friend, Marty Puccio, his ex-girlfriend, Ali Willis, Ali's boyfriend, Donald Semenek, Derek Kaufman, and Heather Swallows, who had never even met Bobby before. Even his closest friend, Marty, showed absolutely no remorse over what they had done. The seven young killers would all be tried separately for their role in Bobby Kent's killing as they had all participated in varying degrees. Bobby's childhood best friend, Marty, the person he is alleged to have seriously bullied and attacked throughout the many years they knew each other, was charged with first-degree murder. In some states, first-degree murder comes with an automatic death sentence, and initially, Marty was sentenced to death by electrocution. However, this ruling was overturned and commuted to life in prison with parole eligibility in 25 years. This means that Marty could one day get out of jail, but for now, he's serving his sentence in DeSoto Annex in Arcadia. Marty's girlfriend, Lisa Connolly, was initially sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Her sentence was overturned on appeal and converted to 22 years. She would go on to have her baby in prison, Marty's baby, and she was released in 2004 after serving only nine years. Yes, nine years in prison for being the ringleader in this plot to kill. She currently lives in Pennsylvania with her two children. Bobby's ex-girlfriend, Allie Willis, was charged with second-degree murder and sentenced to 40 years behind bars. However, her sentence was reduced on appeal to 17 years. She was released from prison after serving only six years, and since that time, she's been charged with several other petty crimes, including theft and a parole violation. Allie is now married with children in Florida, and several years ago, she actually appeared on the Dr. Oz show. It was a wild segment where she pretty much just confessed to her best friend that she had participated in a murder and spent time in jail for it. Here's a clip. Alice is a stay-at-home mother of four struggling with the decision to reveal uh, a shocking secret to her friend Shannon. She fears that revealing this will end their friendship. And she's also set this up to help you understand that if this does end the friendship, it would be uh, very shattering to her. Okay. So, are you prepared to hear what she has to say? Yes. You prepared to say it? Yes. Okay. Alice, you're on. When I was in high school, I was friends with several people. I had a boyfriend that abused me extremely bad. Well, he was supposed to, there was supposed to be a fight and he was supposed to get beat up. He ultimately got murdered right in front of me. Um, 
everybody went to prison. I went for eight years on a 40-year prison sentence. Okay. Did you have anything to do with him Fit being murdered, or it was just because you were there? Um, the majority because I was there to watch a fight and it turned into a murder. Let's, let's be a little clearer, Alice. Um, because of the abuse I had suffered from him. Physically? Yes. Okay. The boys were supposed to beat him up, and it turned into more than just beating him Did up. Did you hire the boys to no. have them beat One up? was his best friend of 15 years. There was actually more to that that I didn't even know of happened between the two of them until after I was arrested to why they did what they did. But that ultimately did... had nothing to do with me, that part. There were, there were two parts, I think, that are important, though. You, you helped get him to that location. Yes. Let's be fair. Yes. You, you got him there. You, yes, I've always taken that responsibility. People would say you lured him there. I've always been there, yes. And then once it happened, then she was threatened with her life if she were to say anything to anybody. And oh, you should also okay. own, own the piece where you were the one that did speak up. Yes, I did. I'm yeah. the one that went to the police and oh, after I basically got the whole investigation rolling. After he was murdered. So it was yes. compli messy, messy, complicated. And with the trauma history and all, you kind of know how those things happen. Mm -hmm. Shannon, I, I see you struggling, trying to get your head around it. What, what are you feeling? Um, I feel that if it was, uh, I've been, I was abused in high school, physically, from a boyfriend for a couple years, but I finally left and just got out. I don't understand why she would actually want people to come to beat him up. I would just have left, or I would have went to the police, got a restraining order, or I would have literally went across the United States to get away from him, Canada, I don't know. If you were that worried, or if they said they're going to kill, if you say anything, they're going to kill you, I would have laughed. Uh, or uh, before the the action, after the action, I don't understand how somebody could just stand there and watch and not call 911. As you see a baseball come out, that would be my first reaction. Even though you probably hated him and you wanted him to die in your heart or your head, I don't, I can't understand why you would just sit there and. Well, it was out in the wilderness. There was no cell phones at the time either. And it yeah. was at a wilderness lake area. It was so undeveloped. And as far as apart from when it happened, I was in it because I had heard from my friend that her boyfriend was basically fed up with his bullying and abuse and the stuff that they were doing together. And he just couldn't take it anymore, so he was going to fight him. And I figured after what he put me through, well, I'd like to see him get his butt beat after being through it. So that's why I was there. Was he still your boyfriend? No. Oh, so you had already broke up. And yes, you knew, we, okay. we had already broken up. Okay. Uh, not, no, I did not expect you to say that. Mm -hmm. But I still stand by you. I know you as a person. Allie's boyfriend at the time of the killing, Donald Semenek, was sentenced to life in prison, plus a concurrent 15-year sentence for conspiracy. He's still behind bars as we speak. Lisa's cousin, Derek DeVerco, well, he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. He testified in exchange for a plea deal, so he really only served six years, and he's out now. He's a single father living in Missouri. Alleged hitman Derek Kaufman was sentenced to life in prison without parole for 25 years, plus a concurrent 30-year sentence for conspiracy. He still sits behind bars, and allegedly he is not serving his time quietly. He's a total shit disturber, and he's committed 18 infractions in jail, including drug use and disobeying orders. And our final perpetrator was Heather Swallers, who got away with a very minor sentence, but she also apparently played a very small role, or really no role at all in the murder. Other than being there, of course. She pled guilty to second-degree murder, and she was released after five years. She now lives in Georgia with her children. So, three are behind bars still, the three that had stabbed and hit Bobby in the head with that baseball bat. The rest are now out of prison and seem to be moving forward with their lives, getting married, having children, and generally just keeping a low profile, of course, with the exception of Allie going on the Dr. Oz show, which is incredibly strange to me, but whatever. Bobby's parents were okay with the sentencing. However, Bobby's sister, Layla, she was not. She really wanted to see Marty especially pay with his life. She would say, quote, it disgusts me that they have freedom after killing someone. They're horrible people and they should be ashamed of what they did. They don't even deserve to be alive. There seems to be mixed feelings with how people perceive this case. There are some who feel horrible for Marty and everything that he had to endure all of those years. 
all of the bullying that he had to deal with at the hands of Bobby. Beyond bullying, really, Bobby manipulated Marty. He blackmailed him. He physically assaulted him. But is that a reason for murder? At the time of the killing, Marty was an adult. If he wanted to get away from Bobby, he really could have at any point. There's also been some speculation as to the validity of Marty's claims. Some people who knew both Bobby and Marty say that Marty was just as much of a bully as Bobby ever was, only Bobby was stronger and bigger. But again, those are just rumors. Only Marty knows the truth at this point. And again, half of the people involved didn't even know Bobby. They had no affiliation with him. They had only heard those same rumors about how terrible he was, how violent he was, how much of a bully he was. And they were more than happy to jump on board. Although Lisa's cousin Derek would later say that he didn't really think that they were going to go through with it. When they were talking, he thought that they were just sort of shit-talking. They had never discussed what would happen if they would ever get caught, if they would go to jail, or about any kind of consequences. To him, it just seemed like they were venting and it wasn't really going to happen. But he didn't exactly do anything to stop it once it was in motion. Bobby begged for his life. He begged his best friend Marty for his life. He tried at one point to crawl away but he was killed in a very violent way that lasted about an hour. So again, it was a slow and painful death. And then Derek threw him in the canal, hoping for the alligators to eat the body. So I pass this question over to you. In this case, in this case in particular, do you think there was any validity to the bullying claim? Or do you think it was just an excuse to kill Bobby? I'd love to know what you think. That's it for me tonight. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Mapper. You can also search for me on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper, or I'm on YouTube, Nikki Young, Serial Napper, and that's all one word. If you're looking for all of my episodes ad-free, make sure you subscribe to my Patreon. I also have exclusive content on there that I don't release on my public feed. Until next time. Stay safe, stay kind, especially in the comments. Bye.